Hello and welcome to the first episode in 2022 of Altitude, our monthly look at the world of aviation and air traffic control. My name is Aidy Dolan, I'm an air traffic controller at Heathrow and I'm delighted that you could join us today for what I know is going to be a really unique insight. This is without doubt the biggest episode of Altitude that we've done so far in terms of audience registrations and it's fantastic to work in a culture where we can talk about the issues we're going to discuss today so openly. An emergency situation is something that all air traffic controllers know that they may face at some point during their career. It's something that we train for, but of course we hope will never happen. Thankfully, serious emergencies are incredibly rare. The industry has an amazing safety record, but when things do go wrong, what's it really like to be faced with such huge responsibility? Can any amount of training prepare us and how can an organisation ensure that we're ready to face the unexpected? Well, I can think of no one better to answer those questions than my two guests today, fellow Heathrow controllers, Adam Spink and Greg Kemp. Hello, Adam. Hi, Adi. How are you? Good, thanks. And hello, Greg. Hello, Adi. Hello, Good Adam. Good to see you. Both of these guys were in the control tower on the 17th of January 2008 when British Airways flight Speedbird 38 crash landed just short of runway 27 left. Greg was the runway controller for 27 left that day. We call that the Air South or the arrivals controller. And Adam was in the supervisor's chair. This is a fascinating story. Greg, let's start with you. It's the 17th of January, 2008. Uh, I've checked, I think it's a Thursday. And you're working a shift with D-Watch, uh, now known as Greenwatch at Heathrow. Uh, we'd been in the new control tower for just under a year. And I guess that everybody was still getting used to the new environment and the new perspective. Yeah, definitely, AD. The, um, uh, the, the, the change from the old control tower, which was, you know, sort of 1950s built to the, 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 the new control tower, um, was, was, was quite significant, quite a lot of... Uh, things changed on the airport at the same time. And, and, and the, the biggest uh, part of that was the, the perspective looking out the window, um, which is a big part of this, this, this discussion that, you know, as we looked out, everything appeared further away or closer or, 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 or different to, to what we were uh, expecting. Yeah, yeah, I remember we, we prepared for that and we actually took watches of people across to the new tower, didn't we? And did visualization sessions just to show people the different perspective. Um, so during the shift, you, you've you've had a break, you've grabbed a cuppa and uh, you've come back and the supervisor has told you that uh, you're going to be doing Air South, which at that time was the landing runway for runway 27 left. Uh, now, obviously, the three of us know what that entails. But um, firstly, how does it feel when the supervisor sticks you in arrivals uh, and what does that job do? Uh, it's a strange one, this, isn't it? Because um, it's an exciting job and, and, and everything we do in, in the control tower is, is exciting and dynamic. However, there are there are some um, parts to the job which become uh, more of a monitoring function than a, an active sort of function. And arrivals is definitely one of those um, whereby we, we monitor the spacing between aircraft. We ensure that the runway is clear before the next aircraft lands on it. And a lot of that is quite passive. Um, so it's considered to be sometimes a bit of a boring job. Uh, arrivals. Uh, I suppose it's one of those where if if Heathrow approach uh, the guys who are who are putting the aircraft on the final approach, if they're doing their job well, it can be fairly straightforward. But it also has the potential to move from very low workload to very high workload quite quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think we're about to, to to talk about that and see that that, that you you sit there and there's just nowhere to stop. And I think that's the the biggest thing about air arrivals that you know these aircraft are coming in at. 160, 170 knots, and 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 usually they always they, they land and they vacate and they land and they vacate, and if they can't land, then they power up their engines and and, and go around, which uh, which is a fairly normal occurrence. So it's um, yeah. So here we are on a fairly normal day, uh, if there is such a thing at Heathrow, and on the supervisor's desk is Adam. Now, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but you should not have been on the supervisor's desk that day. Is that correct? Yeah, no, like uh, like Greg, I was just a, a a normal rostered controller shift, um, but being a, being one of the the qualified supervisors in the tower at the time, I think the uh, the rostered supervisor wanted a bit of a comfort break for thirty minutes to go and get his cuppa. Um, so uh, so he just asked me 
I think probably about half past 12, 25 past 12. He said, oh, Adam, do you mind giving me 30 minutes on the desk? As, as they tend to say. Um, and to, to my knowledge, nothing was untoward at any point there. So I thought, yeah, why not? You know, I can I can sit on the supervisor's desk for half an hour, nice and nice and quiet before uh, I have my own break. Uh, uh, it was a, it was a very straightforward day, but I believe that there was there was something else going on during the shift regarding the actual terror itself. Can you well, tell us what that was? Yeah, well, first of all, it was it was my birthday. Oh, so, right, okay. uh, so that that's very important to, to to establish. And the other thing that happened just after I took over was um, the one of the lifts in the control tower broke. It got stuck okay. between floors um, with with some of our controlling staff um, contained within, and they were very upset. They missed the whole thing. Um, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so so there were various, you know. Not quite procedures, but things to think about at that point for the supervisor. The only other lift that we that we have in the control tower was already broken. That had broken a, a month before uh, with me stuck in it this time. Um, yeah. So so yeah, we were we were sort of starting to think about what implications that might have um, for for an ongoing you know operation. Would it be fair to ask some of our controllers to to walk up about 480 steps to the top of the control tower? uh just before they start working <laughs> yeah so so there are there are little background issues going on uh but generally the operational side of things is is fairly straightforward and and greg speedbird 3a is is vectored by heathrow approach um, from the hold at lambourne um to an ils approach runway 27 left uh he checks in on frequency with you uh and i'm guessing at that stage everything's completely normal yeah, absolutely, AD. The, I mean, of the probably hundreds of thousands of days we work at Heathrow, it, everything, um, looking out the window, you, you see a picture and it's always normal. They always land, they always, you know, 99 times out of 100, everything looks normal. So it was, he, he checked in, he was cleared to land. Um, I think I gave a, a conditional clearance to an aircraft from Terminal 4, going out to the holding point of runway 27 right um, against the landing 777. So absolutely everything at that point in time was perfectly yeah. normal. Yeah, that's right. So you, you've got aircraft that are from that terminal south of the runway to cross that landing runway to get to the northern runway to take off, and yeah. so it's all very standard. And you've 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 done that, and 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 he's read the he's read the landing clearance back, and, and it yeah. really sounds very very straightforward. Uh, and then it, it's it starts to go wrong. So explain to us the picture out of the window, and and when you started to notice that there was a deviation from normal ops. Yeah, so the I think just after the the crossing clearance is given to the Speedbird 229, um, there is a, a moment I I, pick, I I can picture it to, to this day that the the the, the nose of the Speedbird 38 started to pitch up a little bit, um, and normally that's either an aircraft that needs a bit of increased lift or or, or they're carrying out a missed approach, um, but it pitched up so dramatically and quite high, and I think it must have been the autopilot trying to keep the aircraft airborne at the time. Um, there's, there's a picture in my head which isn't right and, and my brain is trying to make normalize and, and trying to fit it into what a normal picture would look like so i'm sitting there thinking the aircraft's going to try and do a short landing and vacate very very early off the runway which is nonsense no aircraft yeah. would do that um but, but my brain's going well, well come on you, you've got to try and make this uh, th th this fit fit what normality is and then i thought well, the aircraft's going around we might have a missed approach powering up its engines and powering off again and I think there's a moment as the nose of Speedbird 38 starts to pitch forward. Uh, that's the moment when when the brain goes, OK, there's something wrong here. And you're then seconds from from from, from the impact at that point. Um, and it's only at that point that, that you start to realise there is something wrong. Yeah. Um, so after that initial impact, your your first responsibility is is to get a crash call in. So so what does that look like and who does that go to? What, what, what's a crash call? It's interesting. The, um, the the crash call uh, as air traffic controllers, we provide an alerting service to, to to the to the airport, to the airport authority, to the police, to the fire service. When something big happens or when something goes wrong, we're the people with the information to to pass that information out. Um, and there are categories of emergency we use, and crash is obviously one of them. And there's a button in the control tower uh, which we all know about. But if you ask the five year old to, to draw a crash button, that's exactly what it would look like. It says crash yeah. on it. It's a big red button. It's got, it's got a flap on it. You pick up and, and you push. 
Um, so the, that, that's exactly what, what we do at that point. So the, the, the impact happened. Um, the aircraft is, is on the ground. And your, my, my immediate responsibility is to tell other people what has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, now, strangely, I, I think we've discussed this, in the new control tower, the crash button, the primary crash button, is actually a separate function on the screen we're using. And the backup crash button is the five-year-old's drawing of a crash button. That's right. Um, but but when, we, when we trained... Uh, when I trained, we always used the, the, the backup one as the, uh, effectively the crash button. So my initial response was to lift that flap and hit the button, the big red button that says crash. Yeah. Um, because that's, that's how I trained to deal with emergencies. That's how my instinctive brain went, right, do something. Um, so, so do I hit that button initially um, and then realize that mistake? So then hit the, 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 the original button. Both of them function exactly the same. So there's no delay or anything. Um, but that's the first thing I, that I remember about this, that, that my initial reaction was a learned behavior. Yeah. Um, and, and we, we talked about the workload increase. So it's very, very standard. And then it goes it goes huge yeah. in an instinct and and shifting from the mundane to maximum capacity in a split second. How how does that feel? How do you cope with it? Uh, and, and, and how do you prepare for that? It's, it's mad, isn't it? The, um, we've all had those moments in our lives where you're, 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 you're trundling along and nothing's happening and all, all of a sudden you have to, to, to pick up what you're doing. And I think this is probably the, the prime example in my life of, of, of that. Um, huge amounts of training, huge amounts of um, uh, background work goes into to being able to deal with that. Um, and we practice this, you know, we, we practice this every year. Um, and we practice uh, the, the the call on the the crash button, and it's a very short list that we that we do, and it's and it's written down in front of us as well. If you hit the button, you can read it. Um, and so the, the the increasing workload is kind of taken away because of that training, that 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 by rote sort of um, process that you go through. So the crash button's hit, and then you sit and you read out the five pieces of information that are, that are in front of you. Um, and after that. It's basically sitting back and dealing with the rest of the traffic. Again, as we said, it's, it's not a position where aircraft can stop. There are three or four aircraft behind the Speedbird 38. So the, and the initial impact is being dealt with. You, you've discharged your task of, of the alerting service. And now you have to go back to your secondary task, which is, you know, controlling aircraft um, and dealing with the hundreds of thousands of calls that then happen with vehicles trying to get on the runway. Um, well, before, before we get to that air traffic control problem that you've talked about, Let's just listen to the audio from that moment where your workload shifts from completely standard to 110% in an instant. Mayday, mayday, speedbird, speedbird, 9595. Speedbird 229, hold position. Aircraft accident, aircraft accident. The position is the threshold, runway 27 left. Aircraft type is a 777. Natural problem is crash. Aircraft has crashed. Rendezvous point is south. Katari 01. Mr. Captain, this is an emergency. Evacuate, evacuate. Transmit on ATC, sir. Fire service on the way. Katari 011, go around a second, go around, acknowledge. Katari 011, go around. Echo Tower, Pi 52, 27 left, November 4, West Gate, Pi on the runway. Pi 2, enter 27 left. Pi 2, on the runway. I can confirm, shoots have been deployed. Copy, sir. Speed of 479, you with me? Hey, firm, 479. Speed with 479, make a visual switch to 27 right if you can now. 479, continue until you're visual then, sir. Hello? Hello. We've had an aircraft crash on the threshold of 27 left. We need to switch everything to 27 right. Okay. And then stop things coming in for the time being. Okay. Ta. Okay. Wow. Um... So before we uh, dissect all of that, uh, I'm just interested to know what it's like, Greg, listening back to that now. You've obviously heard it hundreds of times, but do you recall what your emotions were like at the time or has your brain just wiped all of that negative stuff? 
I, it's weird. It's weird. The, uh, the actual incident, I don't remember a huge amount um, of the specifics. I remember, obviously, I remember the incident, but I, I, I don't, I don't recall all the, 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 the actions that happened afterwards. Um, so my emotions are pretty blank uh, whilst the adrenaline was, was pumping and, and the adrenaline was, was, was pumping through uh, at that point. Um, and, and again, like I said, you, you fall back on your training, you fall back on your, your experience. Um, and um, I think it isn't until later on that, that the emotion starts to show uh, in my voice. Um, but yeah, initially it was, it was just get the job done. Yeah, incredible. So just picking up on a few details that we heard in the audio, we hear the pilot transmit a mayday call uh, using the call sign Speedbird 95 when the actual flight number is Speedbird 38. So, uh, Adam, do you, do you know why that is? Yeah, so I understand it's um, <clears throat> the, the call sign Speedbird 95 was was being used in their, their simulator, their emergency training. So I think it was a case of, um, you know, a bit like Greg mentioned with with the crash alarm, the crash button. That when when you're faced with a situation you're that that is you know quite striking and startling, your brain goes back to an ingrained response if it's there, and and the ingrained response I guess was was to use a call sign speed at nine five at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And and Greg, we also hear the pilot make a passenger evacuation broadcast on the RT. Now we we often hear pilots erroneously. You know, making a PA announcement on on the radio and and you know and vice versa, which is is an easy thing to do, but you spotted it and corrected it whilst trying to issue the Qatari the next aircraft with a missed approach instruction. That was probably a key part of the call. Yeah, absolutely. So I remember again. This is something I was trained uh, in doing. That um, when I first came to Heathrow, um, you'd regularly regularly get pilots saying "dorsal manual, manual and cross check" right. on the RT. And one of my mentors said, tell him you've done that, because what if what if that's the transmission to the cabin crew and then they open the doors and the chutes come out? Yeah. So whilst it's not relevant to you, it is relevant to what's going on inside the aircraft. Um, so let them know that they've, they, they've made that transmission. Um, and I think that's one of the big learning points of, of this for me was the you, 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 you may make mistakes. Uh, because of that instinctive uh, uh, background that you have, i.e. the, the speedbird 95, the, the, the crash button. Um, and also share as much information as you possibly can, because there's an awful lot more going on than just our our, our experience. Mm. Um, so, Adam, the supervisor's desk faces due north, away from runway 27 left. So when did you realise that something was wrong? Well, the first the first inkling I had was, I think when, when Greg said earlier that he thought at some point that the aircraft was going to do a missed approach, I think Greg said that out loud he said oh this right. one's going around that's what right. i remember <clears throat> and and that's a normal thing for for us in the tower to do um because we have to warn the other controllers uh, in the tower especially the controller of the parallel adjacent runway that there's a missed approach so we can deconflict that with departures so rather than turn around and watch what i did on hearing that that uh, exclamation from greg that it was going around or probably going around i thought i'm going to be an efficient supervisor here um, I, I sat down at the desk at the computer, loaded, um, I think the database <laughs> that we used to record Mr. Proches yeah. was already loaded up, um, the daily occurrence database. And uh, I, I can still remember, I started typing BAW38 time 12.42, um, runway dry. Uh, and, and, and then I think by that point, I heard an exclamation from somebody else in the tower saying that it was uh, using a few expletives, that it was uh, that the aircraft was about to crash. Um, so then that's when I turned around and I, I saw it literally about a second before it hit the ground. Well, it, it's impressive to know that your your first reaction at that point is you've got to maintain the stats. I hope my examiner is watching this live stream. Really, that's all I can really say. Important. So as, as the supervisor at that point, uh, you, you've now got a major incident on your hands. Um, but what are you and the rest of the team in the tower doing? in terms of team resource management to help Greg out? Yeah, so there's a few things. Um, you know, obviously the instant it, it hit the ground and then Greg put the crash call on. Um, the supervisor has a, uh, a task to follow up that initial call on the same crash line with more information. Um, the, the, the call put on by the controller is, is literally to scramble the, the fire service and the emergency crews to the point of the, the emergency. The supervisor then follows up within two minutes with, with more information, such as persons on board, um, the, the airline, 
um, etc um, and a few more bits of information um, and and I can I can remember the crash call the, the klaxon in the tower that goes off when when somebody hits the crash alarm um, and then I can remember standing for about two seconds and I can remember I can remember the thought process in my head it was I'm sure there's something I should be doing. <laughs> I saw there's I should be busy. And then I sort of looked down. I saw the red plastic A4 ring binder folder on the soup desk. It's the emergency folder. Grabbed that out. And then to be honest, this is going to make for a terrible live stream, but I can't really remember what happened for the next 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I think because I was so busy. Um, so I, I remember putting on the, the, the second call on the crash line, um, phoning the, the the overall supervisor down at our control center at Swanwick, um, phoning the airport duty manager, um, and you're just following a checklist in this folder, yeah. ticking off that, <clears throat> excuse me, ticking off that those actions, um, and and then liaising with the fire service about how much fire cover have we got, can we keep operating, do we have to close the airport, um, and and then it's at that point a bit like when Greg was saying that that you put the crash alarm on and then you work on all the other problems that are occurring because you literally, you know, apart from getting in a car and driving out to the runway, which I think the fire service would frown upon, you can't really do anything else for that particular aircraft. You have to look after all the other aircraft that are still coming in or still taxiing out. Or So in my, you know, in my mind, you know, you have to look after the staff in the tower. So um, ironically or fortuitously, I guess, we, we had a management meeting going on in the tower at that point. So there are more qualified controllers downstairs than there would normally be. So one of my actions was um, to ring down there and said, you know, anybody who can, who's who's fit and willing to work, please walk up the 480 steps to the top. Yeah. Um, and and because we we would like to, if possible, relieve all of the controllers who were in the tower at the time who witnessed witnessed the incident, get them out on a break just to to decompress slightly. Um, so yeah, that was that was one of the main things that I did. Um, and then the, the watch manager who was in charge that day, who was on a break, um, came upstairs and, and we we double manned the supervisor desk for, for the next sort of 30 to 40 minutes. Incredible. Um, gents, we'll go back to the audio one more time and we'll pick it up now in the immediate aftermath. So, so now we're we're looking at dealing with those immediate air traffic control problems of having aircraft queued up on final approach to a runway, which has a crashed 777 on it. So let's have a listen. Uber 229, likewise, it's up to you, sir. If you wish to shut down, you can do pending further. Okay, uh, if we're not going to move, we'll shut down. Uh, yeah, just, uh, we'll, we'll find out. Just keep them running for the moment then, sir, and I'll call you back. Oh, Jesus. United 954, thank you to send Alice. I've got the shot, I've got the shot, he's going to report visual. I shot him too. Uh, station call. Five six. Five six, enter two seven left now. I've probably given him a heading, won't I? And, uh, shh. It would be a two seven left, Mr. Preach, if you're not visual, sir, but uh, uh, just let me know what your intentions are. Okay, we're still not visual at a thousand feet. Speaker four seven nine ground one two one nine. So uh, again, Greg, before we uh, get down to the detail, uh, you can really now hear in your voice um, that that peak adrenaline rush is just starting to come down and you're starting to kind of deflate slightly. So uh, how does that feel at the moment? So, so this is the bit of the incident I actually remember more. The, okay. the, the, actual, the actual crash and the, the, the aftermath of that, I think there were a Qatari missed approach behind the, the, the 38 and then the, a shuttle switch and then the Speedbird 479 because it was in cloud, couldn't see the other runway. Yeah. Uh, there was an awful lot going on and the, hundreds and hundreds of vehicles called to enter the runway and each one of those had to be cleared to enter the runway. So there was so much going on. It started to get a bit more quiet. 
And at that point, I, I do remember, because you've got a crashed aircraft in front of you, and I remember seeing mm. people come down the chute. So there's all these fire oh. vehicles around it and foam around it. And again, we talked about the normal picture. It's such an, such an abnormal picture that um, I, I remember getting quite emotional at that point. I remember thinking the, 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 the reality of everything, you know, you're, you're, you're numbed by the, the, the adrenaline and the, the, the immediacy of doing something. That all of a sudden you sit and start to take in the picture and start to, to think about what's just happened and what you've just gone through. Mm. Um, so, yeah, yeah, the, I, the, the deep sighs and the deep breaths and the, 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 the you know, yeah. yeah, it was an interesting time at that point, I think. I think there was hairs on, the, the hairs on my arms are actually standing up right now. I'm also going to have a listen back on that again. Wow. And, and just the technical stuff. So, for the, again, the benefit of everybody watching and listening, just talk us through what you're trying to do with that traffic on the final approach, because you've got Katari, then you've got Spirit 479, uh, which sounds like a 767. Uh, and then you've got a shuttle, which is probably an Airbus 320. And, and and they're now all approaching a runway that they cannot land on. So the Katari is yeah. an easy, an easy go to missed approach. But then, then you're looking at switching everything to the other runway, which requires a bit of work. So talk us through that. Yeah, absolutely. This is the, um, what you were saying there about people doing jobs to help you uh, as a team and team resource management, the thing that we, 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 we do quite a lot and very well in the control tower, the, the Air North controller um, actually uh, cleared his runway for, 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 for me to use. So the Qatari was only about two or three miles behind the, uh, the, the, the 777. So that was sent around because there was very little option to do anything else with that. Um, the two behind that, the 479 and the shuttle, were asked to report visual with the Northern runway. Um, and if they were visual with the northern runway, they were going to be asked to do a visual switch to that, and then they would be able to land on on that northern runway. Um, and all of the coordination for that was being done verbally with with the guy next to me, um, who was fantastic at the time. Again, that, that you know, to have a good team around you at, at moments like this, um, it's not just me controlling the emergency situation. There's so much else going yeah. on. Um, so the first aircraft switched, and I think stayed on my frequency. But again, these these pilots have just heard. One of their colleagues crash. Yes. These pilots are hearing the the emergency calls and flying into and seeing a crashed aircraft uh, uh, on the southern runway. Um, so it's it's an interesting time, I think, for everyone at that at that moment. Uh, again, adrenaline would be pumping through for them as well. But um, yeah, yeah, I think we we switched the first one. The second one was asked to report visual or carry out a missed approach. He ended up getting visual, so we switched him. Um, and then the phone call to radar, as you heard, that we asked them to stop. Uh, establishing things because I think we just needed a few minutes just to say what are we going to do now yeah you could definitely tell that as well where you know the the, the next the next one behind Qatari is Speedbird 479 and, and he's obviously he's obviously tuned into your frequency oh, yeah. his absolute carnage is unfolding and he's just listening and taking it all in yeah. and then you suddenly think right I'm going to do something with him and you say Speedbird 479 he just goes 479 and he's yeah, just he's I, absolutely on it I was, and, and, and if there are any pilots listening to this, please don't think it's the wrong way. I've never had a more responsive pilot in instruction <laughs> in my entire career. He was, he was, he would have done anything for me. <laughs> anything at all. So, so Adam, talk us through, we've mentioned training a lot. So how much training would you undergo to prepare for this kind of event? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, very much like pilots, we have a legally mandated requirement for emergency training. <clears throat> and, um, it, for us, it's it's two days a year. We we generally do um, with some other, you know, few hours added on as well, and and that's a mixture of of using our um, sort of using time up in our ATC simulator, um, and also tabletop discussions. It it's also a requirement to to um, carry out a crash call, you know, as we just heard. But uh, if you if you are lucky enough not to face an emergency in, in that year, then then it's a you know a simulated one, still using the same equipment up in the, the control tower. So your examiner might might just tap you on the shoulder and say, right, that aircraft there has a, a fire in the undercarriage. Do a crash call, and you have to ring up. And obviously, they're pre-warned that it's a drill, um, so the fire service don't actually scramble um, unless they need the training as well. That's uh, something else that we need to bear in mind. Um, and and. Over the years, we have had the opportunity to, to go into some of the airline simulators as well during the pilot um, uh, training, uh, and that's always very valuable. Getting the other side of the of the radio. Mm. And, and Greg, I, I guess that despite doing all all that stuff, it, nothing replicates the pressure of a real life incident 
Uh, and I'm guessing that none of your emergency training sessions prior to that give you the same kind of um, psychological stimulus and response that this one did. Oh, absolutely not. No, no. The um, as Adam was saying, we, we used to go into the Sims. I think we were discussing this before. We used to have a, a day from of chaos. You know, there would be aircraft crashing and 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 there would be things bursting into flames and helicopters going wrong. And we used to just simulate complete chaos on a, on an airfield. Um, and 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 it's taken seriously. Obviously, it's taken seriously. Um, but the 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 immediacy of, of an actual incident, uh, you, you you can never train for that properly when you when you see. Um, like I said, I, I've probably seen over six million aircraft take off and land in my career, um, and they always land and they, they're always safe because we we're very good at what we do, and the pilots are very good at what they do, and, and the airlines are very good at what they do. Um, so when it when it when it crashes or when something goes wrong, it's so incredibly different. You, you can never train properly for that, but you can prepare yourself. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess the training gives you that that automatic response of of the mundane things like you know like the crash call, like the yeah. missed approaches and things that you just yeah. you just clicked yeah. into. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 um it's very. I mean, at the end of the day, what what we what we're discussing, Super Three Eight, was a very you know visually spectacular thing, um, but the actions that Greg took were probably no different than if an aircraft landed and burst the tire as it was vacating. Yeah, um, yeah, the runway's closed. Yes. You, know, you, you put an emergency call on to help the aircraft that needs um, assistance, emergency assistance. You sort out the aircraft that are coming behind that um, and, and you know, liaise with the other controllers in the tower to, to make the situation safe. But this is a very extreme example of that. But Absolutely. it's all about, you know, training those responses so that everybody has the same response as well. Yeah, definitely. And and thankfully, and most importantly, there were there were no fatalities in, in the accident. So the thing is, neither of you guys would have known that at the time. Um, yeah. So, Greg, how did that affect you afterwards? You get unplugged and someone then relieves you of that position and then, then you go downstairs. What does that feel like? Oh, it, it was. Um, I, I don't mind admitting. I I, I burst into tears. I, I, as soon as the I, I was I was relieved by the incoming controller, I stepped away, and 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 an emotion just overtook me because it had been emotionless for for the probably only five or six minutes of the actual incident happening. Um, I honestly thought I'd seen people die. I, I genuinely thought thought that people have died, um, oh. and that that then starts to you start thinking like, you know could I have done anything differently? Could I have helped more? Could I have um, and I remember going downstairs and going into a restroom and calling my partner at the time, just saying, look, I, I've just seen people die. Um, and I needed to know, I needed to hang around and watch the news. Um, I, I think they, I can't actually remember a huge amount about this, but I think they said, you know, do you want to go home? And I said, I want to watch the news. I want, I want to see what the reports are. And as soon as we found out that actually there were no fatalities, that was incredibly important for, yes. for me dealing with the, the the situation for all of us in the control tower dealing with the situation i think um and that's and very good at looking after us when, when things like this happen we have um uh, procedures and people that, that, that call us and say you know do you want to talk about it are you okay um and, and i genuinely needed that at the time it was um yeah it was quite an emotional experience after that yeah so was, was that support there kind of immediately did you have it over a number of days it was, um, and, uh, we were talking about this uh, slightly earlier on, that the, the, I, I remember getting home and um, I got a phone call from a lady that, that ran the SISM uh, team and, um, and she talked me through the situation, gave me some advice, um, told me not to, not, not to drink anything, it's probably a good idea not to do that, which I completely ignored, I have to admit. <laughs> um, and um, the next day uh, we, we had, she, she gave me the options of, of having some, um, some, not therapy, but some the ability to talk to someone if I wanted to. Um, we all got into a classroom about a week, two weeks after it and, and talked through what had happened, right. uh, which again was, was incredibly, I don't know whether this is something we're coming on to, but um, it was incredibly helpful just because you pick up the picture. I had my picture of what happened. Adam had his picture of what happened. But there were probably seven or eight people in the control tower that day and hearing their story lesson learning wise was fantastic and also for for, for, for dealing with the emotion of the situation was was, was great yeah that's, that's that's very powerful you know everybody sitting together and i found i found it amazing that the next day was your annual emergency training session i was i was doing the sim the next day for my my truce uh, which is our emergency training and I remember going home and I hadn't cancelled it. And, and I remember going home and I thought, I don't really want to go into work tomorrow. 
Um, and I called up our boss at the time, and he said, "Great, that's fine. Don't, don't, don't come in tomorrow." I, th- I think you've, I think you've handled your emergencies uh, for, <laughs> for this year. For the next twenty years. Yeah. Um, so, what, what, what do you both think were the were the lessons that we can learn from both an ATC and a human factors perspective? Adam, I'll start with you. Uh, I, th- I think, <clears throat> I think it goes back to what we said earlier. You know, the that ingrained response, that repetitive training over and over again to get the basics in in your brain so it's an automatic um, reflex um, and that the understanding that when you're under pressure you will make mistakes will occur you know it, it doesn't make you a bad controller or a bad pilot or a bad any you know bad surgeon or a bad you know policeman or anything mistakes will happen we're human the brain will always try to pattern match and and see you know draw upon your your training or experience in the past of what to to interpret the what you're currently going through um so you know there will always be mistakes and and if they can be mitigated before you make them then you know that's that's all the better and and that comes through you know safety culture and procedures and standardization and all those things that we're used to in aviation absolutely yeah craig what about yourself you were right there in the hot seat do you do anything differently today or is it just the same. Uh, I'd say so. My my, there's this. We, we do. We've done a lot of training on um, uh, the, the crews do this with our crew resource management and team resource management, where where we 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 basically accept challenge and we accept uh, people saying, actually, I, I'm not entirely sure that's right. Um, which is difficult to do when you you have a, a hierarchy within within aviation, which you have on the cockpit and you have you know seniority in, in the control tower. Um, so I think the. The, the biggest point I took out of it was, was my expectation bias around what was happening to the aircraft. It's trying to vacate early. It's doing a missed yeah. approach. That actually, to, to believe what you're seeing and actually make preparations around that. Um, operationally, um, I think the, ex- the the knowledge that all hell will break loose. Like there, there were so many vehicles. You don't necessarily hear it in the in the RT that we've heard. So many vehicles calling to enter the runway, which is yeah. you know the most important bit of concrete we have um that you cannot control that at some point we just we just said the runway's closed yeah um, which we didn't have a procedure for at the time it was you know you meant to have a representation <laughs> of each vehicle on the run it's just physically impossible um so so that was that was uh, a big lesson learning and um yeah get, get people out as soon as something like this has happened it's incredibly important to to remove that controller from from operation because there will be an emotional response absolutely um and the 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 the, the post incident uh talking about things and help that's there is, is incredibly important absolutely Re- really good points guys um we have got so many questions uh we're gonna have to try and do our best to get through as many as we can in the next 10 minutes or so so the first one is is from tom um so this is this is for you greg um tom is a pilot and he said if heaven forbid another similar event was to happen um how helpful is pilot initiative so his thought process is the controller's capacity is extremely limited and is it is it is it really for him to think right i should send myself around or i should perform a visual switch myself or i should continue down the ils to an obviously blocked runway what are your thoughts on that um i i would say that um the 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 purpose of our job is to to create order where there would be absolute disorder um if if pilot initiative is a wonderful thing but if, if they started to initiate missed approaches or visual switches which hadn't been coordinated with my colleague who's controlling that runway, that is not something I was expecting, that would just add to the confusion and the chaos. Um, we, are, we are trained to deal with these situations and, and there's a lot more time um, than you realise when things like this happen. So the next aircraft, there was quite a lot of time for me to go in and talk to the aircraft. I would just say, continue your, your previous clearance, continue your descent to that runway, even though it is closed, even though it is blocked, we will deal with you. Um, we're very good at doing this um initiatives a wonderful idea but if we have five people all creating a different plan then you're going to sow an awful lot of chaos and that's kind of what the, the function of air traffic control is it's you know one person one plan we'll order it um and 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 uh, and, and we'll, we'll promise we'll make it work brilliant um adam you can have this one this is from terence who asks um did training subsequently change in any way in response to any of the learning points that were identified um you know i i and 
please guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I can't think that there's anything specific about this incident that fed back into our training and changed it. I think um, I think mainly it was about, you know, analysing what happened and why it happened and, and then promulgating those sort of learning points. There were learning points to come out of it, certainly yeah. around RT loading um, and, and Greg's touched on it about the vehicles that that we we had been working so hard with the airport and the driver community on the airport about how important runway runway safety is and how they must always stop short of the runway and call air traffic control before entering the runway. Um, but of course, that that then leads to if there is an incident, every single vehicle will be calling up on the RT to get a runway entry clearance. Um, but there's there's no right answer to that um, sort of conundrum. It just means in, a, in an emergency situation that the RT loading will will increase. Um, I think there probably was in a, in a wider context. I think the the airport then you know started to look at fire cover, um, and 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 I think possibly one thing that that we did learn, and and it goes touches back on Greg's point about the the response to uh, a serious incident and um, the uh, the discussion that that you know people need to have after that type of event uh, to defuse um, that possibly we recovered too quickly too early. Um, the next four days were very complex in its operation um, from an air traffic control point of view. We were running one runway for departures with a reduced takeoff distance and but some aircraft needed a longer runway so they would go off the other runway which is only being used for arrivals so we had to create a gap and we had to ensure that that departure took off in that gap so there's a very complex situation for the next four days you know we all know that controllers are generally people who like to get stuck in and solve problems and make decisions and sort the situation out um, and looking back on it maybe I think we probably you know put out an air of calm and everything was fine and we were you know all all fine about it and yeah let's get cracking and stuck in but after four days of that unusual configuration and operation I think a lot of us were quite tired um, so you know that's something I think definitely we've taken on board since that incident and and we've learned far more that that okay when we're recovering from something we take it easy you know take yeah. five that's a slogan we sometimes use as well make sure we're all prepared for it um, and and that recovery, I think, would now be a bit slower and a bit yeah. more gradual. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Greg, uh, Lawrence asks, uh, how do you quickly divert all of those aircraft that are due for landing? Um, do you have to stop departures to allow for more landing aircraft to, to land at the airport? Interestingly, I think the, the after the incident happened, there was an aircraft on the northern runway ready for departure. Um, and I think my colleague launched that aircraft into the to the sky to clear the runway. It's a much quicker way of making the runway available. Um, and of course, then we we, we stopped uh, aircraft coming in with with our colleagues over in uh, in, in in Southampton. Uh, so we held the aircraft in the stack. But obviously, there's an impact then of aircraft having to hold further en route because it's a dynamic system. And you know, aircraft are airborne three hours up to 12, 14 hours away coming to Heathrow. Um, you can't just suddenly stop. 12 hours worth of traffic. Um, so I, th I think it ended up with high level holding over Europe for inbounds into Heathrow. So there's, a, uh, there's an incredible pressure on us um, with that. But yeah, we, we, we stopped everything. Um, I think one aircraft got airborne, then we landed the, 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 the two that were visually switched. I think the Qatari came back round and landed. I'm not yeah. entirely sure if he had, and whether he held, he came back round and landed. Um, and then, as Adam said, we I was out the, out the scene at this point, so this is not my, I, I don't actually remember uh, much of what happened here, but I think we started we started operations again because that's what we do. We we deal with a situation and then and then make a system work. It's, it's kind of what we're we're good at in our jobs. Um, and, and like Adam said, one of the lesson learnings over that was, do we go back in there too quickly? Um, but yeah, again, we probably had 20, 30 aircraft on the airfield that that needed some sort of service yeah um, yeah you know it was uh but yeah yeah the, the, the a lot of aircraft I think, I think there were quite a few diversions to other airports and things like that towards yeah here. absolutely um adam you can have this one because you're a bit of a, a technology nut uh would the technology of today have changed the actions or decisions of that day uh, i don't i don't think so 
don't think um, we've got anything extra. Maybe no, we maybe no. CDM. Yeah, I don't think. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't think there's really anything that technology could do. Even technology that I'm thinking about might be twenty years away. I don't. You know, it's obviously there was the technology on the aircraft that that didn't quite work as 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 intended at the time, which caused the problem. Um, which has obviously now been redesigned and and that situation should never occur again. But um, which is something that aviation is very good at. Mm. Um, it's learning from from incidents like this. Um, but I don't I don't think there's any specific piece of technology that certainly not that we have now that would that would have uh, made a difference. Yeah. Uh, so, Greg, uh, you can get the last one, which is from Craig. <laughs> And he asks, um, have have you had any first hand experience uh, of any incidents of this magnitude since? And did the experience of Speedbird 38 uh, alter or shape the way that you work? Oh, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, so one of the things I think I took away personally was um, uh, speed of delivery of, of some of these this bits of information and that when you are busy, you can s suddenly speed up. Um, and one of the things I heard myself doing was 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 the, the checklist we had for the emergency was read the preamble. So it said, you know, type of emergency and I actually said type of emergency. And that just slowed me down yeah. uh, to, to deliver um, information. And I do that an awful lot more now. So I've, I've had incidences, but nothing of the magnitude of this. Um, again, I, 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 I was I was in the control tower for a, a previous couple of um, crashes that have happened at Heathrow. <laughs> Um, Remind me never to work with you, Greg. Never jinx, really. <laughs> um, but again, they were non-fatal. It was it was it was very well handled. Um, we regularly have aircraft land and burst tires, and, and as Adam said, the the reaction to a burst tire for an aircraft is exactly the same reaction to an aircraft crashing. You hit the crash button, you give the information, you shut the runway, you deal with the aircraft behind. It's just the the magnitude of the situation. Um, so I've had a few of those. Um, as, as we all do, um, but uh, but yeah, no, no, nothing, nothing. Touch wood. Has Gents. happened since of that magnitude. Yeah, thank goodness. What an episode. Um, I am afraid that that is all that we have got time for. Um, thank you all so much for watching and for all of your questions, uh, and a huge thanks to to Adam. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Lady. Cheers. And Greg Star. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Lady. Thanks, Adam. Um, for sharing their incredible story and guys for your honesty and openness it's been really fantastic uh, we'll be back next month for another episode of altitude please keep an eye out on our social media channels to see what that's all about um, other than that thanks for watching and listening goodbye